like to welcome everybody to my lecture on the minimum wage. Um, this past year has been a big uh, year for topics such as the minimum wage, talk about the living wage, President Obama's campaign to raise the federal minimum wage. Um, he pushed through and, and got uh, uh, the ten dollar and ten cent minimum wage for uh, federal workers or anybody working on federal projects. Um, and of course, there's the Bacchetti book on uh, inequality, economic inequality. Uh, and of course, there is a great deal of widening the gap in terms of inequality um, in the United States. Uh, and so a lot of people think that um, in order to reform the system, to address equality, to reduce poverty, uh, that it seems like it's a no-brainer just to simply raise the minimum wage. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. Is that really the solution to all of these complex uh, problems that exist um, in the U.S. economy? So what is the minimum wage? Well, in addition to the standard analysis of the minimum wage, which you could get in just about any college uh, classroom uh, in the United States. Another thing that we're going to be doing in here is showing the difference and the superiority of the Austrian approach to economic theory in, in comparison to mainstream economics price theory. So uh, you're probably pretty well familiar with this. In the United States, uh, the minimum wage is, is simply a law that mandates that all payments to labor um, reach at least a certain level per hour. And currently it is $7.25 an hour and has been so for uh, approximately the last six years when it was installed in, at the $7.25 an hour level in July of 2009. In real terms, it was one of the highest minimum wages um, in the United States. Now, of course, as inflation erodes away at the purchasing power of that, uh, the, the real minimum wage has declined somewhat. Uh, and in response to that, 31 states uh, have their own minimum wage laws mandating that workers get paid more than the federal level of $7.25. Uh, and a lot of cities have actually uh, mandated minimum wage laws for their cities. So particularly in the western part of the United States, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles have all established higher minimum wages and they're ratcheting them in so that a lot of those minimum wages are going to go to like $15 an hour uh, over the next couple of years. But it also uh, exists in Kansas City, the DC area, Maryland, um, and other places have minimum wage laws that are higher than the state level. Uh, Fourteen states have a federal have a minimum wage law, but it's exactly the same as the federal level. Five states have no minimum wage law, so the federal law applies. They don't have any state law, and the states without minimum wages are typically here in the South, so Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, places like that. So that's just basically what it is. And there are a lot of opinions as to what minimum wage laws do. And so I've drawn a couple of opinions representing the diverse opposites uh, views of the minimum wage and what it does. On the one hand, we have the view that there's just no evidence that raising the minimum wage cost jobs or causes unemployment. At least in the, if the starting point is as low as it is in modern America. This apparent defiance of the laws of supply and demand occurs because, quote, the market for labor isn't like the market for, say, commodities like wheat because workers are people. This is obviously someone thinking at a very high level. <laughs> Very high. <laughs> now, on the other hand, we have people who will say, 
any Econ 101 student can tell you the answer. And he, in other words, the, the stupid people I have to hang around with will say that the higher wage uh, of the minimum wage law reduces the quantity of labor demanded and hence leads to unemployment. Clearly, the advocates of minimum wage laws very much want to believe that the price of labor, unlike that of commodities such as gasoline or Manhattan apartments, can be set based on considerations of justice, not supply and demand, without unpleasant side effects. And of course, the unpleasant side effects is unemployment. So who do you think, can anybody uh, offer me a guess as to who, what prominent person uh, is responsible for this quote? Krugman. Got it. <laughs> Paul Krugman. He's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Krugman, like every economics textbook. Krugman um, was working at Princeton and for a long time, that's where he won the Nobel Prize. He's been writing for the New York Times for several years, and he just moved his appointment to a university in New York City, um, closer to his Manhattan apartment uh, condominium. Now, who do you think said the, the other quote? You. Any 101 student can tell you that's going to lead to unemployment. Ron Paul. Milton Friedman. Those are good guesses. They would have said something like that. Hayek. I, I, yeah, Hayek, all these great thinkers. Paul Krugman. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Process of lo logical deduction over there. Uh, this is, I think this is like the third time this week I've had a Paul Krugman said this and then he said this. <laughs> well, that's, that's a big point <laughs> that we're trying to drive home is on the one hand and on the other hand, you know, that these guys will say just about anything. Okay, so what does the minimum wage law do? Well, from the Austrian perspective, the minimum wage, it's not just a problem of unemployment. Okay, that's not the be all and end all. We don't like to work for one thing. Only 2.6% of the American workforce is even subject to the minimum wage. They're working mostly part-time and they're not supporting families. But we're interested in the full economic content and we don't want to get lost uh, by trying to stick with one measure of effect. So minimum wage causes some combination of the following. Unemployment. Okay, it, it, it uh, forces people to be unable to compete for a job based on price or wage. Uh, it leads to discrimination in the workforce. So it puts, in particular, minority teens at a disadvantage in the workforce because there's more people who want jobs than are going to be able to get jobs. And some, so some employers will make their decisions on their personal discriminating tastes. They just don't like, like tall people or minorities. And so the minimum wage gives them an opportunity to discriminate. Uh, there's a decrease in job benefits. All jobs come with some kind of benefits. Uh, here at the Mises Institute, we're proud to offer our employees free coffee and tea <laughs> without payment. We don't have to pay. Candy bar, it's in Different story. <laughs> uh, but we, we have this package of benefits. Most jobs have packages of benefits. Uh, then there's a decrease in job desirability. Every job has a multitude of different aspects to it. And all of those aspects can be adjusted or dialed up and down by the employer. And so when you're thinking about a job, uh, employees do consider the wage or the salary important, but they also consider all the other aspects of jobs to be important. Do I have an office or am I in a cubicle? Is there air conditioning 
And what level do they set it at? Is it 80 degrees, 75 degrees, or here at the Mises Institute, 63? <laughs> Except in my office, which is the only place that isn't cold in the entire building. <laughs> So you can imagine employers can change these things, and if they're forced to pay higher money wages, they'll tend to decrease job amenities. Um, and then there's also a hidden, but just as important, increased demand for capital-intensive labor. So that, yeah, what is that? An increase in the demand for capital-intensive labor. Well, uh, I see it going back and forth uh, every day, from work, there's various construction projects, and on some construction projects, there's a bunch of guys out there with shovels, digging dirt, uh, planting trees by hand with shovels. Other construction projects I've seen around town, they all have mechanized um, tools to uh, do the planting of trees. So this one site that had this little tractor and it had this little screw thing, that was about that wide, and it would go through and dig out the holes to plant the trees. Okay, so the guys with the shovels are competing against the guy with the tractor and this drill. The guy with the tractor and the drill is probably costing the project something like $35 or $40 an hour, whereas the guys out there in the heat with the shovels, $10 an hour each. So if there's, say, four or five of them, it's $40, $50 an hour to do the same task. So low-skilled and high-skilled are competing against one another. And if we raised the low-skill wage from $7.25 an hour to $12.75 an hour, those low-skilled guys would be at a disadvantage to the guy with the little tractor and the drill. And finally, of course, jobs get automated, partially or completely. Um, so McDonald's, for example, is rolling out uh, a series of new restaurants where instead of people taking your order, you're going to go up to a kiosk and place the order yourself, and that's going to tell a bunch of machines in the back to produce a Big Mac, French fries, and a Diet Coke. And so most of the jobs are automated and lost. Okay, so that's the basic effects of the minimum wage. I'll be talking about them in more detail as we go through the lecture, but I wanted to get a little perspective about labor and the misconceptions about it. First of all, question? First of all, employers don't determine wage rates and working conditions. It seems mm -hmm. as if they do. It seems that they get to set the wage and the working conditions and that they have wide latitude in terms of what they do. But actually, it's the market that sets wage rates and working conditions. Okay, when I'm working at Auburn University, the president of Auburn University does not set my wage. The department chairman, the dean, they don't set my wage. On the other hand, I don't get to set my wage. If they get to set it, they'd probably want to pay me $10,000 a year. If I got to determine it, it would probably be something more realistic and in line with my efficiency and performance, maybe $800,000 a year. <laughs> but neither one of us, neither one of us get to make that choice. It's the market that makes that choice. It says, we've got to offer this guy what's in line with market wages for this type of job and his productivity. And then there's other things like the Malthusian trap that employers only pay employees the subsistence amount of living. And that, that's been a, a bugaboo um, throughout uh, the history of economics. Uh, but of course, we were born, or economics was born in a period where a lot of people did get just a subsistence wage. And people compare that today with the minimum wage. Obviously, things have um, improved a great deal, but it hasn't been through the, with the help of labor or labor laws. The, the whole idea 
that employers determine everything, they only give subsistence wages, and that if it wasn't for unions and labor laws, we'd all be beggars with barely clothes on our back. This is utter nonsense. Under capitalism, if you look at the real history of capitalism, what you see is that real wages have consistently been rising um, in countries that were capitalistic. The work week has fallen in capitalism. In other words, we work fewer hours today than we did 50, 100, 150 years ago, and our real income is substantially higher even though we're working fewer hours. Child labor in advanced capitalistic uh, economies has been virtually eliminated, unfortunately, and uh, workplace safety has consistently improved without government. Yes, I'm, in, I'm very much in favor of child labor. Employment. Yeah, that's right. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the biggest problems with the minimum wage. As a matter of fact, Alfred Marshall, writing in the late 19th century, 1888, was the first edition of his uh, Principles of Economics book, which was the dominant uh, treatise at the time, uh, dealt with the concept of unemployment on less than one page of the text. Today, of course, we have pretty much a chapter of unemployment in the micro section and a chapter on unemployment or more in the macro section of most principles texts. Ludwig von Mises said that this is a distortion to say that factories carried off the housewives from the nurseries and the kitchens and the children from their play. These women had nothing to cook with and to feed their children. These children were destitute and starving. Okay, so before the Industrial Revolution came around, pretty much the vast majority of people were at a subsistence level. And starvation and plague were common occurrences. So that if you look at the Industrial Revolution 250, 300 years ago, uh, the mass production from the factories during the Industrial Revolution and since <laughs> we're producing to sell precisely to the masses. You don't have mass production if it's, you're only producing for kings and queens and noble, nobles. Okay, the, the, um, the iPhone is not produced just for billionaires and Hollywood celebrities. Okay, so we're gonna cover a little bit of labor economics, some of the basics of what's involved here, uh, because once you have a realistic view of what's going on in the labor market, you're better able to understand what's specifically going on in with the minimum wage law. Labor versus leisure. We have a labor-leisure trade-off. We have a preference for work relative to labor. Excuse me, labor relative to leisure. So labor is an important factor of production along with capital and land. Um, and the more we labor, the more we can produce. Uh, but this is, of course, limited. We only have 24 hours in a day. We only have so many skills. And we like leisure, okay? Because leisure is a desirable consumer good that must be foregone. So we'd rather get more wages, not through working more, but from what's called labor productivity. And labor productivity improves or increases when we're given better tools. In other words, when the capitalists have the money to give us better tools, we end up making more money. We end up having fewer people with shovels and more people with these funny little tractors and the drill bit to, to plant trees with. And therefore our wages go up as a result, but it's the capitalist having savings to invest that drives that labor productivity. And things like the minimum wage are the things that scare off the capitalist from investing. Okay, so in Austrian economics, we work until the value or utility of the return from working is exceeded by the disutility of giving up leisure. So we're constantly weighing 
what we get from labor versus the utility or satisfaction we get from leisure. Okay, so this is a trade-off, a taste that we have. Some people uh, like leisure a lot, like one of my brothers, and other people prefer to work hard all the time, most of the time, obviously. Um, what the minimum wage law does is it denies low productivity workers the chance for a job. And we're going to talk about the, the specific Austrian concept of productivity of workers, but there's obviously people who have the lowest uh, productivity. Uh, these people tend to be without skills, without job experience, maybe handicaps of various sorts. Another important aspect of the labor market is job satisfaction. I've brought this up before. Uh, certain jobs are more desirable on the surface. Other jobs are not so desirable. There's risks, hazards, nasty things about the job. So there's these great jobs, jobs that everybody wants. You know, they want to be Tiger Woods. They want to be Michael Jordan. They want to be some ho uh, Hollywood celebrity. They want to be Woody Allen. It's all particular to your taste. Okay, so for example, making wedding cakes and being an Austrian economist at the Mises Institute are highly desirable jobs. <laughs> As a matter of fact, once people realize that I'm here year-round, I inevitably get a question at lunch asking me, so exactly how would I get a job like yours? <laughs> no, but really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, but not right now. <laughs> uh, and you'd have to pay me, too. <laughs> okay, so... The only problem with these great jobs, like making wedding cakes, okay, that's fun. It's hard work. I mean, it takes a long time. Uh, but it's fun work, and you get to deal with customers on the most important day of their lives, where everybody's dressed up, everybody is having a good time, everybody is optimistic, and everybody is drunk by the time the cake comes out. <laughs> so those types of jobs tend to not... Um, get great wages relative to um, similar types of jobs. So if you were just, you know, baking um, rolls or something like that, that wouldn't, you'd, you'd probably get maybe even more money if you were good at that. Uh, and if I had to teach economics at Auburn High School, they'd have to pay me a lot more money. <laughs> And then some jobs are displeasing. These are the jobs that we don't want to think about that we're in college in order to avoid. Uh, embalmers. This is one that was never on my choice set. Didn't want to do that. Uh, prison guards. Uh, didn't want to do that. Uh, did not want to be in a coal mine or something like that. Uh, and sanitation engineers. Um, also not a very desirable job, cleaning the sewers and, and things like that. So these are dirty, dangerous jobs, but they tend to come up with some nice uh, economic uh, results. As a result, um, the minimum wage law, if employers are forced to pay more monetary wages, they'll reduce the amenities and make work less satisfying by making all sorts of adjustments in the job. Benefits and taxes also affect um, employers do not have to pay more than your discounted marginal value product or revenue product. Um, the consequence is if you get increased benefits, you'll get a decrease in take-home return or wages. So if we get free coffee at the Institute, um, that's going to lower our take-home pay by a very, very small amount. 
but they can afford to give us free coffee and uh, we don't have to go out to get coffee. We don't have to go to Starbucks to get coffee. We don't have to pay $5 to get coffee. So it works out for everyone. Uh, mandated benefits like Obamacare also tend to decrease take-home pay. Increased taxes decreases your take-home pay. Uh, employers don't ever pay your taxes for you. You pay your taxes, so you pay your Social Security tax, and you effectively pay the employer's contribution to your Social Security. They never pay more than what you're worth to the company. So all three of these factors have contributed to stagnating wages and employment, and the minimum wage reduces the side benefits of, from the workplace. So if you're, at a, if you're at an establishment where a lot of the workers are getting the minimum wage and it's increased, you can expect to see some side benefits reduced. Okay, wages in the Austrian literature, and you can look this up, we don't have to know it for today, but the uh, discounted marginal value product of workers' wages uh, start with the product, what is being produced, value, how much is what you're producing worth in terms of revenue, and then marginal refers to at the margin or declining. So if we add one more worker, how much is going to be contributed in revenue to the firm? And discounted simply means the fact that, say for example, you bring your bicycle into me, I fix it and charge you $30 and you pay me. There's no discounting necessary there. But if I'm a pharmaceutical researcher working on coming up with a new drug that isn't going to likely uh, be in the pharmacy for the next 10 years, then what they're paying me now has to be discounted for that 10-year period because they're paying me $100,000 now and they're not getting any revenue for 10 years. So it's not an important point uh, for today, but this is the Austrian perspective. Uh, there's an example in Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State that sort of lays this discounting factor out. If I plant something on your farm today that will yield uh, revenue of $20 a year from now at the end of the crop season, and if the interest rate is 5%, then the most I'm willing to pay you is $19. If you were willing to accept my offer of $15 to plant something on my farm, I would earn eventually a $4 profit and $1 interest. So if your discounted marginal value product is 19, then we would expect that other entrepreneurs would tend to bid up your wages. Okay, so if, if you were somebody who could plant something that was gonna be worth $20 a year from now, and I was only paying you $15 an hour, other entrepreneurs or farmers would see that and be willing to pay me, say, $16 for that same service. Therefore, in this competition between entrepreneurs, we would expect to see that labor was paid something pretty close to what it's actually worth. So in other words, in a market economy, um, we would expect to see laborers receiving wages that were approximately equal to um, their discounted marginal revenue product or what they're actually worth. Okay, the supply of labor. Obviously, labor has alternative uses. If you think about the job market today, if you were to drop out of college, there's various places where you could fit in to the U.S. economy. However, uh, we don't want to work all the time we value leisure, and so we don't want to necessarily, you know, sleep eight hours and work 16 hours. And the more work we do, the marginal value of, of uh, the first hour of leisure increases. So the supply of labor is upward sloping, just like every other market. Uh, therefore, the logic says that more labor by an individual, more labor in the economy as a whole, is only going to be supplied at higher wage rates. 
And so that's the basis of our upward sloping supply curve of labor as wage rates increase for an individual or for a particular market of labor, we would expect to see more people uh, enter that market and people be willing to work more hours per week. So this is, you know, this is just looking at the labor economics that we looked at before about leisure being a trade-off with labor, um, and then that pops up as the supply of labor being upward sloping the way it typically is. Now, as you get really high wages, uh, this supply curve of labor can, at some very, very high level, start to go backwards. Okay, so if you're a guitarist and you're getting paid $1,000 uh, per show, um, you may be willing to you know, go out more and more shows, uh, but if you become famous and you get $40 million per concert, well, then it's not necessary to do three or four shows a week. You may do a dozen shows a year and you've got all the money you can possibly spend. So some really, really high level of wages, it can turn backwards. The demand for labor, uh, again, basically based on the discounted marginal value product of labor. Labor is demanded as it is value producing. So we're really looking at how much does that marginal employee contribute to the overall revenue profile and success of a company. So we could be talking about just adding a janitor to the company, uh, somebody who is going to go clean up, uh, dump the trash, sweep the floors, not really producing any product, not really producing any revenue, but because that janitor is there, that means a lot of the employees who are generating revenue can actually spend more time on that revenue generation process. And so by looking at the guy that we're adding, we don't see any dollars and cents. But if we look at the overall profile of the company, we may be freeing up 25 workers 15 minutes each per day, creating revenue for the company. And as I said before, labor productivity is a little bit misleading. Uh, there's only so much a worker can do under the circumstances they're placed into. They have a job to do, they have a certain set of tools, they're given a mission, uh, they've only got a certain number of hours, so they can try to become more productive, working frantically and so forth, but generally speaking, labor productivity is, an inst is set in an institutional framework and that we really get more labor productivity from the capitalists, the capitalists who give us better tools or economic professors who make people so much smarter. So it's not really the productivity of labor, rather it's the increase in capital uh, the tools that we have, and the extension and expansion of the structure of production. So that social div division of labor that you've been uh, exposed to as a concept, this is where it really becomes a reality as we become uh, more specialized, uh, as we get better specific tools at what we're doing, we become more productive, and as a consequence, wages rise. So you can very well imagine a world where there's lots of lawyers, and then you can imagine another world where there's lots of lawyers, but there's also specialists, people who, um, uh, uh, lay, uh, excuse me, lawyers who specialize in tax issues, uh, lawyers that um, uh, specialize in international business questions, uh, lawyers who specialize in patents, uh, they're specifically specializing, they've got the proper tools to specialize in that, and they become more productive and they have more revenue. This is what actually increases the marginal physical product of labor and the discounted marginal revenue product of labor, and ultimately that tells us what's going to happen to wage rates. And so the demand curve for labor is like the demand curve for anything else. It's downward sloping to the right. Um, as wages rise per hour on the vertical axis, the quantity of labor demanded 
decreases. So in a static setting, the demand curve for labor is downward sloping uh, to the right. So supply and demand is what determines wage rates in a market economy. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the earnings per year of registered nurses. So nurses with a high skill set. Um, and then on the right, we have hotel, motel, and resort desk clerks. Okay, people without any apparent training whatsoever. Um, and so it's easier to supply these, this type of jobs because a lot of people can do it. You don't need any specific training uh, or certification. Uh, this job is hard. You work long hours. You're exposed to sick people for usually 12-hour shifts. Um, and bad things happen in hospitals. It's one of the leading causes of death. Whereas the desk clerk, the desk clerk um, is just standing there, more or less, and plugging things into the computer and handing you a credit card. So, um, the conclusions. Well, wait a second. Oh, yeah, these are the conclusions about the labor market. Wages are determined by the market. Uh, there's no unemployment in a pure market economy. There are people without jobs, but in a pure market economy, there's nothing that, that we would call unemployment. Um, and then wage rates are driven by increases in and improvements in the tools that we use that we do our jobs. In my case, it's better laptops and these things that I just love to play with. <laughs> the minimum wage hurts uh, the intended beneficiary. The intended beneficiary is the low-income, low-skilled worker. However, a minimum wage is, sets a floor, so we can't go through the floor. Legally, we cannot go through the floor. The equilibrium wage determined by market forces is down here. The equilibrium quantity of unskilled workers is Q star. If to help people in this area, of these low-skilled workers, we create a minimum wage above the equilibrium wage, what happens is that um, employers, because of that higher wage, will have a smaller quantity of labor demanded. And so the quantity demanded shrinks to QD, and the quantity of labor supplied increases to QS. So more people want uh, those uh, jobs at the minimum wage rate. And so uh, typically what happens is that when you have this minimum wage increase substantially above equilibrium, what happens is, is that minorities, teens, and unskilled, unexperienced workers cannot get access to the job market. And the increase in the quantity supplied tends to be um, non-minorities, um, and spouses, non-working spouses uh, seeking a second income. So a long time ago when I was in school, they would, they would talk about this being the house, uh, the, um, the, the housewife entering the workforce and this, the minority teens getting shut out of the labor force. And teenage unemployment in the U.S., is about three to uh, three and a half to four times the overall unemployment rate. So teens are obviously being systematically shut out of the workforce as a result of the minimum wage. And minority teen unemployment is twice the non minority teen unemployment. So currently, it's close to 40% of minority teens are unemployed. They're forced out, they're not allowed to compete. Okay, so minimum wage laws, when they're quote-unquote effective, when they're set above, far above the market rate, 
that's why that's when they're effective. If the minimum wage today was 34 cents, we wouldn't have this class. It causes compulsory unemployment. Okay, so not being able to get a job against your will. Uh, it decreases side benefits from the job. Uh, all the various things that uh, be uh, employers benefit. Sometimes that's uh, health insurance. Sometimes that's sick leave. Sometimes that's free coffee and tea. Sometimes it's all sorts of things. It worsens uh, working conditions, lighting, uh, air conditioning, uh, size of your office, having to work in a cubicle rather than an office. And by the way, I just found this out. Um, one of the reasons there's so many jobs in cubicles is because of the federal tax code. If you want to write off or depreciate an office with four walls and a door and a window, you have to depreciate it over 38 years. If you have a cubicle, that cubicle is considered office furniture and you can depreciate it over seven years. So employers are given the incentive to use cubicles rather than offices, which everybody hates, by the way. And it was two German guys that invented cubicle office space. Okay, uh, and the big thing here is that it hurts marginal workers, teens and minorities, people without uh, work experience, job experience, skills and training, these are the types of jobs that give you experience, skills, and training, even if they're basic skills and training. Um, and so the intention here was to help these marginal workers. And what actually happens is that those marginal workers are the ones that uh, face the negative consequences of the um, minimum wage law. And as I pointed out, it increases the demand for high-skilled workers, particularly union workers. So it's all the opposite of the intentions. Now, some people say, let's just pass the minimum wage increase to customers, uh, but that doesn't work. Businesses cannot pass increases on to customers. If they could just raise their price to their customers, they would have already done it. There's nothing more than a business person wants is but to raise their price. <laughs> so this is not a possibility. But in mainstream economics, it's kind of a mystery. Can they or can't they? Well, they basically can. Uh, so the minimum wage law only increases cost, but not revenue. Therefore, profits are lower or even turn to losses. And losses, of course, lead to reduced output or the shutting down, bankruptcy of the firm. Uh, bankruptcies and shutdowns reduce supply and reduced supply leads to higher prices. So yes, eventually the prices do get raised. But they're not just passed on to somebody. Okay, what's happened from the minimum wage to the shift in supply and the higher prices is that you've cost people jobs. You shut companies down. You've made a lot of other companies less profitable. And so it's not just a pass on. So we just can't pass on cost regulations and taxes. It ultimately destroys jobs. That's what's going on. That's what ultimately leads to the shift of the curve. Any questions? Yes, sir. So when we talk about the desirability of the job, uh, if the minimum wage is raised, uh, people will find that the dirty jobs will not compensate anymore and they will go to the amenity job, but there, there will not be so many amenities. So do you right. think that the minimum wage would decrease the people seeking for dirty jobs and there will be a less profits for these companies? Well, I mean, when you increase the minimum wage and you create unemployment, there is going to be uh, more people unemployed looking for work and also people coming in to take advantage of those higher wages. So there would be more people s searching for jobs um, in all areas that are relevant to the minimum wage. It doesn't really, you know, it doesn't um, affect college professors in that sense. 
Yes, sir. Uh, why does the government want to induce, uh, introduce the minimum wages? I mean, is it because the minimum wage cannot uh, make uh, the people uh, survive to meet their uh, daily needs? Yeah, the minimum wage doesn't really apply on a survival basis. It, it's only in the, in the American economy 2.6% of the workforce, and most of them are not uh, full-time workers supporting a family or supporting a household. They're usually, uh, all those people are making at least above the minimum wage. And so it doesn't apply, but, you know, as with inflation, you see workers, particularly in the U.S. economy, their real income is falling, uh, while the incomes for the top 1% are rising. And there is this economic inequality that's basically explained by Federal Reserve policy. And Federal Reserve policy cannot be uh, positively affected by something like the minimum wage. So it's a concern for low-income workers. But the whole point here today is that the minimum wage law does not address the concerns of very low-income workers, it actually hurts those very workers. Thank you very much.